hospitals fatigue. Um, welcome in if you um, are just joining us. This uh, webinar is called Fighting Finals Fatigue and feel free please to share your name, your HBCU affiliation in the chat box. Um, my name is Dr. Gina Newsom-Duncan. I'm going to introduce myself in just a moment. Um, but again, please share your name and your HBCU affiliation. And if you attended an HBCU other than the HBCU where you now work, please let us know that as well. So this workshop is brought to you by the Steve Fund in partnership with the United Negro College Fund. The Steve Fund is the nation's leading organization focused on supporting the mental health and emotional well-being of young people of color. The United Negro College Fund's Institute for Capacity Building builds upon its heritage of supporting Black colleges and their outsized impact on student success and community progress. Together, both organizations have partnered with HBCUs to center mental health for their students, faculty, and administration through workshops, seminars, conferences, and virtual resources. And you can visit www.unapologeticallyfree.org to learn more. So again, I'm Dr. Gina Newsom-Duncan. I am a mental health expert with the Steve Fund and I'm excited to be your facilitator for this evening. And just a little bit about me. I'm a psychiatrist in private practice in Charlotte, North Carolina, and a proud HBCU grad. I'm a graduate of Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia. Um, my husband is also a Hamptonian, and um, we are the parents to two wonderful daughters who are 17 and 12, who have also, by the way, declared that they will be going to HBCUs as well. <laughs> All right. Before we get started um, on in our time today, I wanted to do some settling in and, and do a grounding exercise, but I think it's especially important to do that in light of the news um, that has, has um, come about today. Uh, I don't know whether you were aware or not, but there's been another, uh, yet another shooting on a college campus um, today at UNLV. And I think it's important to just, um, you know, to, to maybe pause for a moment and, and to think about and send our thoughts to those who were affected. And then also to just acknowledge the, um, we're going to be talking today about stress. And so these sorts of occurrences are just other um, examples of the kind of stress that we find ourselves facing. And I think all the more reason why it's important to do a little bit of settling in and grounding. So um, we'll go ahead and get started here. Before we do this stress test that I have, I just want you to take a, a, a deep breath. We're just gonna breathe in through our nose and out through our mouth. So in through your nose, out through your mouth. And let's do that one more time. Inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth. I think it's really important, um, especially when hearing any kind of news that's shocking, but even just in transitioning from the busyness of, of what you've been doing today into this session right now, just to take a moment of mindfulness. Now, I have something called a stress test that I'd like you to do. It's really simple. Um, on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the worst, I want you to think about like your stress level. So 10 is like stress to the max. What level of stress? Where where are you sitting now? What's your level of stress? You know, are you a two? Are you a seven? Are you a nine? If you don't mind just putting that in the chat. What level of stress? Where are you sitting right now with your stress? You can put it in the chat or you can just um, think about it. I see, okay, six. All right. Um, yeah, I'd have to say my stress level in these last couple of days, probably around a six, seven. Um, so knowing where your stress is, is important. Um, and we're gonna talk about that more. And I think it's, a, again, a good kind of check-in. I see here Kirsten says seven. So it's, a, it's good to kind of take your pulse and see where you are currently um, experiencing stress. Now, I'd like you to ask yourself this question. What do I need to let go of right now? You know, there are lots of things that we carry um, that cause stress and uh, tasks of our daily life, the things that we need to get done. 
sometimes it may be that we're carrying some things that aren't ours to carry, but that are causing stress. So are there some things that you need to let go of right now so that you can alleviate some of that stress for yourself? And then what do you need to pick up? What do you need to pick up today? Are there some techniques or um, skills or just other things that you're looking for that you're hoping to get out of our time today? Because if so, I would love for you to put, put that in the chat as well, because I'll absolutely um, try to address that. All right. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive in. So we have some goals for our session today. Um, the, the primary focus today is on self-care and initiatives that you as leaders can implement to prioritize your well-being during high stress periods, such as final exams. Um, we're gonna talk about strengths and being able to leverage those um, and other effective stress management techniques. We're also gonna talk about signs and symptoms of common mental health concerns, work-life balance. And then as we get into our discussion, would love to kind of uh, talk about how you as leaders on your campuses can foster a supportive team environment. So in terms of our agenda for today, we've got grounding in context, we've kind of done that already. We're gonna talk about leveraging strengths, understanding the effects of stress, common mental health concerns, some essentials for emotional health, and then self-care strategies. And then we're gonna end with a discussion. All right, so if that sounds good to you, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, some community agreements here. If possible, if you feel comfortable, you're welcome to turn your cameras on. Um, I would definitely love for you to engage in the chat and the discussion. When we get to the discussion point, you can feel free to come off of mute. But in the meantime, um, please engage in the chat. This is a community of growth. And so um, hopefully you're going to feel like this is a safe space for you to, um, to engage and to think about um, what we're going to be talking about today. Please ask questions. If you need me to slow down, go back to another slide. Don't hesitate to do that. My only two asks of you are that you be introspective and that you complete the survey at the end. All right, so you make it look easy, you HBCU faculty and staff members. Um, as a, like I said, as an HBCU graduate and also I'm the daughter of a former HBCU president, um, I, I know you make it look easy, but we know that it's not. What you do um, is not easy. So we just wanna take a moment to shout you out and um, say cheers to you for making it to this point in the semester. Um, if there is anything that you are proud of, of yourself for, uh, for this semester, or just in general, take a moment and, and um, shout it out, shout yourself out in the chat. We would love to hear it. But just know, um, again, congratulations making it to this point in the semester. So again, I said self-care is essential. That's what this session is about. And um, when I think about uh, helping professionals, that includes faculty members, staff members, you're working with students, you are working on um, you know, working toward a higher purpose. And you often may feel like the person at the, um, the bottom of this pyramid here, kind of holding everybody else up. Well, self-care is essential. Um, all right, I see Michelle said, still standing. All right, love it. Yeah, if there are other things you want to shout yourself out for, please, by all means, go ahead and put that in our chat too. Um, but yeah, as, as helping professionals, you are doing a lot of work, holding a lot of others up. Um, it's essential that you take the time to take care of yourself. And so I just wanted to say at the very beginning of this, it can be easy in these kinds of settings to think, you know, oh, these are good topics that might be good for my students, or this might be helpful for my family or my children. We really want you to focus on you. There actually was a, a recent session um, that was dedicated to students. So this is your time to think about you, all right? Now, recognizing strengths and assets. It takes a lot of strength to do what you do. Um, and I have a list here of um, some different strengths and assets, passion, motivation, persistence, empathy, spirituality and faith, resilience and perseverance. You know, certainly our HBCU forebears had these right, in order to um, start the institutions that they started and to keep things going. But you have these as well. And I'm curious, are there traits that are listed here or others that you see in yourself? If so, please let us know. You can put that in the, in the chat. You know, do you, do you recognize yourself as somebody who has really good perspective 
or are you driven by a sense of purpose? Um, is faith really a bedrock for you, right? So just think about that. And if there's some that, that you see in yourself, let us know. All right. So the reason that I bring up strengths and is to think about how we can actually leverage strengths. So by knowing and understanding your strengths, you can be intentional about applying them in areas where you're experiencing stress. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more as we go along. But um, a good resource I wanted to share with you is something called the VIA Character Strengths Survey. It's a free online um, resource. If you've never really given a lot of thought to like what in what areas you particularly shine or what you know, specific areas of strength you have, I'd encourage you to do that as a way of um, you know getting to know that aspect of yourself better. And we'll talk more as we go along about how that all fits in to, um, to stress and stress management. It looks like we've got the link to that BIA character survey in the, um, in the chat. All right. So as faculty and staff members, um, I'm, I can say by, by show of hands, how many of you feel like you are giving your 100% um, especially at this point in the semester, I imagine that, that many of you do and probably may feel kind of tapped out. So I wanted to talk a little bit about role strain, which is um, the challenge that can come from um, trying to fulfill the expectations of a single status or role. So in your um, in your role as a faculty member, you know, you may be teaching multiple sections of a course, you've got different um, different exams and other assignments that you're trying to grade and teach and tutoring and all of those sorts of things. And it can be challenging in that role. But I would imagine too, um, that for many of our institutions and many of our HBCUs, um, where resources may, be, um, may not be as strong as other institutions. And so you may be wearing multiple hats. So your, your job description may say one thing, you've got bullet points on for your job description, but then there may be some other roles that you're playing as well on campus. And that all together can create some role strain and can create stress. Um, if you would like to share with us, in what ways are you experiencing role strain in your position at your HBCU? Um, would love to, to get your feedback on that. And also if, um, if perhaps not in your own position, but if there are other ways in which you, you see role strain and um, challenges with resources being something that, that creates challenges on your campus, you can let us know that too. So let me pause here. Okay, I see Kirsten says limited administrative support. Yeah, so um, Kirsten, I don't know if you are a faculty member or if you're in, um, you know, on the staff, but limited administrative support means regardless of your role that you're you're doing more than probably what's on your um, on your job description, maybe doing the jobs of of, um, of several people. Um, Michelle says none. Okay. Um, so yeah, just thinking about those um, the ways in which that role strain may be a source of stress. Now, I want to talk about a little bit about intersecting identity. So um, you all are, um, I see, yeah, does that here says I'm wearing multiple hats. You took the words right out of my mouth. So that, that's exactly what I was about to say. You all are wearing multiple hats, right? So you may be a faculty or staff member, but you may also be a parent. You may be a spouse or significant other, a caregiver to um, elderly parents or other loved ones. Um, many of us are active in our communities. You, know, you may have a leadership role in your sorority or fraternity or other community groups at church or in your spiritual community. And so all of those different roles um, and the ways in which they can pull us in different directions can create stress, even if we get a lot of joy out of them, even if they're meaningful to us, it can still create stress. And at a time like this, this time of year, some of that um, can, can particularly be challenging. I also want to acknowledge that we're living through a period of significant uncertainty. You know, I had this slide, I was going to, to share this with you, but you know, to learn just before we started this webinar tonight about yet another college shooting, um, it, it's really uh, 
it's very stressful this time that we're living in. Um, so in addition to the stressors that you may be experiencing personally, um, there's also there are the broader societal stressors, gun violence, the COVID pandemic, um, and, and others, uh, racial un unrest and injustice. So I'm not intending here to just layer you on or you know, just hit you or bombard you with um, layer upon layer of stress. Um, but I do want to validate and kind of acknowledge the things that I think many of us are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's important because um, we may recognize that we're stressed, but if we're not giving thought to exactly how or where that stress is coming from, then it can be harder to think intentionally about the strategies that we want to employ or to apply to help manage that. Does that make sense? So um, in addition to the things that we've talked about so far, one other area of stress right now is the winter holiday season, right? So um, I'm sure you all are, are experiencing this right now. We've got work deadlines and final exams, social obligations um, with holiday parties and other things like that. Um, managing other others' expectations can be a challenge at this time of year, um, whether that's around uh, your students and what they're expecting, um, whether that is administration, other faculty members, whether that's your family with the holidays. Another source of stress during this time of year can be um, grief, loss, loneliness, or other challenging family dynamics, right? So again, not trying to overwhelm you with stress, but I just want to, I like to kind of put things on the table and say, and to acknowledge and validate what you might be experiencing. So if any of you can identify with any of these, let me know, you can, can put that in the chat. All right, so stress takes a toll on us, right? Um, we have a sympathetic nervous system that um, is designed for us to be in the fight or flight mode. And certainly if there's a car coming or if you were hiking and there's a bear, your body is designed to go into fight or flight mode to get you out of danger. Um, but then after that, you're meant to come back to, um, to or homeostasis. Your parasympathetic nervous system um, should then kick in. That's the rest and digest mode. The reality though, is that these days with the things that we are experiencing, and I'm just going to be honest with you, since learning about the UNLV uh, shooting, I've got this knot in my stomach, right, that, that wasn't there before I learned about that. So my fight or flight has kind of has kicked up. With the, um, with the types of stressors that we're experiencing these days, we often spend a lot of time in fight or flight and, and don't come back to rest and digest enough. Um, and so experiencing an excess of negative stress can take a toll not only on our physical health, but on our mental health as well. Um, and, you know, again, acknowledging that there are a lot of stressors that we can't control. So what we want to be thinking about is in, in the context of stressors that we can't control, what things can we do? And that's where I want us to kind of focus our attention. But before we go to that, I'm going to talk a little bit, bit about mental health. So let's talk about it. What, what do mental health challenges or symptoms look like and feel like if, if you've been under a lot of stress and it's starting to take a toll on you mentally and emotionally? What could that look like? Well, um, to me, I think about burnout. I don't know if, if you all are able to raise your hands or use the, the um, you know, little feature here on Zoom or if you want to put it in the chat. How many have been in burnout or experienced burnout before. I know I certainly have multiple times over. And when I'm in burnout, to me, it feels like mental, emotional, and physical exhaustion. Okay, Gazette says me with multiple excl exclamation points. Kirsten says yes. Um, and I would, I would expect that you all would be knowing where you are in your semester. So, you know, yeah. Burnout, um, whether you're there now or you've experienced it before, sounds like that's a common experience, right? Um, so yeah, for me, it's like mental, emotional, and physical exhaustion. Um, I find also that when I've been burnt out, I start losing interest. Like I don't really feel like doing it, doing things. Um, and so for some people, whether it's burnout or something else, 
that loss of interest in meaningful activities can also be what a mental health challenge could feel like. It might feel like anxiety and worry, anger and irritability, um, moodiness. Um, it may feel like being um, spiritually disconnected or feelings of hopelessness. I see Michelle says that Cafe Bustello doesn't get me through the whole day anymore. Michelle, I can agree with you. When Cafe Bustello won't get me through the day, then I know, you know, it's something, something's got to change, right? Um, so yeah, these are some of the symptoms or the things that mental, um, mental health challenges can feel like, right? What might it look like? Well, it can look like isolating, um, you know, just kind of withdrawing, uh, sleeping too much or too little, lack of hygiene, or maybe just not keeping yourself up the way you normally do, not really caring about what your hair looks like or going to get your nails done, caring what your clothes look like. Um, it might look like avoiding friends and family or social events, calling out sick from work, ruminating, okay? I think that it's important here to, um, to just take a moment because I don't want to pathologize burnout. Burnout is... Uh, the natural consequence of having too much stress for too long. Um, but it's important to recognize that mental health exists on a spectrum. And so it, it is important to realize that there can be times when it's more than burnout. So the question is, how low is too low? Uh, and I just wanted to share about, you know, major depression and kind of give that, give some context here. So somebody who's experiencing burnout um, may be experiencing some of these same symptoms that we see with major depression. But the difference is that if you remove the stress, like, you know, finals are over, you can go on vacation, kick your feet up, um, the, the stressors are removed, then you feel better. Um, however, when someone is experiencing major depression, they have um, depressed mood and loss of interest pretty much all day, every day for at least two weeks. And then there's some physical changes that they also experience, concentration changes, sleep changes, um, maybe feelings of guilt and worthlessness, and in severe cases, even suicidal thoughts or plans. Um, so I think that it's, again, just important to be aware and um, wanted to share a resource with you. This is um, through Mental Health America. Um, they have an online screening tool, and I think we're gonna put that in the chat um, that you can go online if you're cur curious for yourself or for anyone that you care about, um, students or family members. Um, this screening tool allows you to go in and kind of put in symptoms or look at the symptoms of different mental health conditions, whether it's anxiety or depression, um, which can help to give a sense if you are concerned that you might need or someone else may need further support. All right. So one of the things, let me pause here. If there are any questions, if you want to put them in the chat, I'll, I'll pause here. And if not, you can always feel free to, um, to let me know if you have, have other questions. Um, one of the things that I love about being a psychiatrist, being a mental health professional, is that there are so many proactive things that we can do to manage and support our mental health. Um, but it takes intentionality. And so I wanted to share with you some essentials for um, emotional health. They are awareness of your thoughts and feelings, healthy strategies for managing painful emotions in the moment, staying mindful and remembering to breathe, and having someone to talk to. This is the, um, this diagram right here is what we call the CBT triangle, cognitive behavioral therapy. But basically what it what it is conveying is that our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are interconnected. And that's really important because it, it's pretty difficult to have a painful or upsetting emotion without having had a painful or upsetting thought that preceded it. So, you know, thought like nobody likes me um, or what if I fail at this? Those thoughts produce uncomfortable emotions and they impact our behavior. So having an awareness of what we're thinking and how it makes us feel and behave is really important in terms of um, being able to stay mentally and emotionally healthy. Um, what strategies do you use to manage difficult emotions? When you're feeling, you know, I'm sure we've all been there, overwhelmed, anxious, really upset. Are there any things that you find 
helpful. All right, see meditation and music. Absolutely, I love those. If uh, dancing, does that sound nice? Awesome. Well, y'all are um, getting right to what I was going to share here in this next slide. Um, these are some tips that I have for managing painful emotions in the moment. Um, first of all, breathe through it. Um, sometimes it can feel like these painful emotions are coming on like this, you know, tornado here on this um, in this picture. But breathe through it. Squeeze something. If any of you are moms or have given birth, you can think of it like a contraction, right? Breathe and squeeze something and um, distract yourself and recognize that it will pass. And Michelle says, breathe, talk it out. Nice. Look at pictures. So absolutely, y'all y'all are already um, thinking about those sorts of things. Other steps that I would recommend, if, if you have not tried this before, I definitely recommend it. Stop and write out the negative thoughts. If you feel like there's just an onslaught of um, em negative emotion or anxiety or um, anger that you're feeling, stop and write out your thoughts. There's something powerful about getting it out of your head and onto paper that um, really helps you to see your thoughts a little bit more objectively and get some space between those thoughts and the way that they're making you feel. Also, changing your environment. So get up and go for a walk, get some fresh air dance, right? Um, speak positive affirmations, turn on music that makes you feel good, and then give yourself grace. Um, I, I can't say enough, honestly, about that, that part. Um, I think we have to recognize these are really challenging times that we're living in. And um, I can't say enough about the work that you do, uh, because my HBCU changed my life. All right. And so, you know, I, I applaud you and, and think that the work that you're doing on your campuses is so important because you create safe spaces for us to be, for, for us to be ourselves. And that takes a lot. I know. Um, and I know that you're carrying a lot. And sometimes it feels like the expectations are just like mounting. There's so much need and so much that needs to get done and limited resources at times. But the reality is you're human. So is everybody else. So it's important that you give yourself grace when you're feeling overwhelmed. Breathing, again, is really important um, because breathing actually switches off the fight or flight response. It, act, it activates our parasympathetic nervous system. And so it's, it's um, really important that you be in the habit of doing that, um, not just when you're in the midst of like real, you know, feeling overwhelmed or in painful emotions, but throughout the day. Uh, and so I have a quick breathing exercise that I'd like to share with you now and um, hope that this is a tool that you'll find useful. I'm going to share a, a breathing technique that is um, for stress reducing. And you can do this anytime, whether you're sitting or laying down. It's an all day kind of situation. So it's not just like for any part of the day. And it's called the six, seven, eight breath. And what it does is it gets your body into something known as the parasympathetic nervous state. This is where you get to rest, relax, digest, your immunity kicks up, your digestion kicks up, all the feel good hormones are kicking up as well. And it's super simple. So essentially what you do is you breathe in for six seconds, you hold your breath for seven seconds and you exhale for eight seconds, six, seven, eight. So go ahead, you can close down your eyes, you can wiggle your shoulders, just find your comfy seat and take a deep breath into your nose, and exhale out your mouth, let go. And in through your nose, start to breathe in for six seconds. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Hold this breath for seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And exhaling from your mouth for eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Breathe in deeply into your nose and exhale your mouth. There you go. 
All right. I hope you found that helpful. And, you know, I think that video is all of a minute and 45 seconds. So um, just as a, a tool that you can use. I wanted to point out that when it comes to our mental health and um, emotional health, there are certain cultural factors that can sometimes serve as both strengths and challenges. Um, and thinking specifically about an African-American community, I'm curious if there are any that come to your mind as maybe cultural factors that are uh, that can be strengths, but also challenges. If you have any thoughts about that, you can put that in the chat. Um, I'll go ahead and give you a couple that, that I think of. One is the, um, the concept of the strong black woman. Um, the idea that um, we need to be strong and, um, and to kind of maintain equanimity um, despite stress and, and challenges, that has served us very well. But research also shows that when um, people really adhere to that strong black woman stereotype, it can actually prevent help seeking because it prompts us to use self-silencing and, um, and self-reliance as strategies, and so that can block the um, the ability or the comfort with reaching out for help. Another one that I think of is um, faith and spirituality, or the idea of you know letting go and letting God. My faith is extremely important to me, so I believe in faith as being a tremendous coping strategy. But sometimes we may find that you know, well, if I reach out for help or or talk to someone or you know seek therapy, that that means I'm somehow not as strong in my faith, right? Okay, and I see someone saying, yes, can agree with that. So just those are things to think about, right? Um, but I want to make the point that you don't have to do it alone, okay? Everybody needs somebody to talk to. I'm a, a trained psychiatrist and therapist, and I have a therapist. I see her once a month, and it's wonderful. Um, it gives me a space to just talk about the stresses of everyday life and to have a space that's just dedicated to me. So it's part of my self-care practice. Sometimes there are some barriers to therapy. It could be logistics, maybe stigma. You know, we have to acknowledge, especially in the African-American community, there tends to be stigma around um, therapy. Uh, for some people, it may be finding the right fit with a therapist. But I would say don't be discouraged if it, if it takes a while. And um, you have the right to keep looking until you find the right fit for you. But just know everybody needs someone to talk to. Um, these are some resources that we always like to share from the Steve Fund, the crisis text line um, from the Steve Fund, and then also the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is a really important resource to be aware of as well, not only for yourselves, but your students and, and other loved ones. Okay, so as we get ready to kind of move into our discussion, I want to talk a little bit about managing transitions and just acknowledging that stress, anxiety, and irritability can often come up around life transitions, whether we're talking about the everyday transitions, like getting out of the house in the morning. I know for me, as a mom of a high schooler and a middle schooler, just the morning, trying to get them out of the house while trying to get myself ready for work, it's just stressful, right? Um, seasonal transitions can also be stressful. Starting school in the fall, the change of semesters, final exams, um, going into the holidays, and then larger life transitions like the birth of a child or a child graduating and going off to college, um, separation or other types of loss. So I'd like to ask you to think to yourself, how well do you handle the stress of transitions? Um, because if you know that, know those things about yourself, again, we're thinking, you know, how do you use certain strategies intentionally? Um, just using myself as an, as an example again, I realized some years ago that the start of the school year is really stressful for me and I tend to get more anxious and um, it's just something about moving out of the summer into the, you know, being a, in, on a more reg regimented schedule. Um, by knowing that, I've started pacing myself a little bit differently and planning my vacation time a little bit differently um, as a way of being more gentle to myself during, um, during that time. So if there are things that you are already doing um, or that you've done in past seasons, maybe to manage like stressful transitions, please let us know. Because again, this is a community of growth. There may be something that you're doing or you've done that could benefit someone else who is, um, is here on the webinar tonight. All right. So I have some tips for minimizing stress during this time of finals and the holiday season. 
And um, and then we're going to move into a discussion. Oh, I see Kirsten says journaling. Yeah, love it. Um, journaling is, uh, well, I've got another slide. You, you must have been reading my mind. Um, but journaling, I think, definitely is a, a really great way of kind of managing stress and managing transitions. Um, so my tips for you for this holiday season and, and during the finals, first of all, is to pace yourself. Now, it may feel kind of hard to do that because things are probably in, you know, on full tilt right now with the deadlines that you have and the semester quickly coming to a close. But wherever you can, think about um, pacing yourself. Anything that you can take off your plate that is optional, if you feel like your plate is too full, really consider doing that. It's important to also set healthy expectations for yourself and of yourself. Um, you know, is it, how realistic is it for you to meet everything that you have, um, that you have to do in addition to maybe the things that you wanted to do or that other people may be expecting you to do? So setting healthy expectations is really important. Um, prioritize sleep, healthy eating, and exercise. I know this is the time of year when um, it's hard to do any of those, right? If you're preparing for finals, you may be having to stay up late. You may be getting less sleep. Um, healthy eating is really hard this time of year. Exercising when it gets, you know, it's colder, it's getting dark earlier. But being mindful and at least trying to prioritize those things can really make a difference and give you a buffer as you're trying to you know, manage this season. Setting boundaries around spending when it comes to the holidays can be helpful. Um, and then making space for uncomfortable emotions. And what, what do I mean by that? Well, um, if, for example, maybe the holidays are hard because you've experienced some loss, whether you've lost a loved one recently or even, um, you know, not so recently, the holidays can still be challenging. And it may be important to give yourself some time, some downtime, either before or after the um, the holidays, before or after the semester ends, to just um, feel what you need to feel and to not have to be on, okay? Um, use social media in healthy ways. If you find that, you know, every time you get on social media, you get into this, like, comparison of what other people are doing and you're feeling bad, you get that kind of, like, sinking feeling in your chest of, um, you know, not doing enough, then, you know, pay attention to what your body is telling you. And um, I would recommend putting it aside for a little bit. And then use mindfulness techniques to stay in the present moment. So the breathing technique that we did, there are lots of other ways. Basically, anything that um, gets you to tune into your senses, what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're feeling, um, can help to bring you into the present moment and activate that parasympathetic nervous system, all right? So um, I'm curious, if there are any self-care practices, I think you know, we've already had some listed, Kirsten listed um, journaling, if there are self-care practices that you're already using, especially ones that you're using this time of year when things are so hectic, let us know. Um, so here are my tips for um, self-care for helping professionals. Um, eat healthy and move your body. I, I like to stay away from the word exercise because that can sound like a chore, but move your body. Set healthy boundaries around your time and your emotional space. And you absolutely have the right to do that, um, to set those boundaries. Hold space for yourself. So journaling, like we've already talked about, prayer and meditation, having somebody to talk to, whether it's a therapist or a close friend or family member, all right? And then finally, remember to make time for fun, okay? That's fun with friends, family, with your significant other. If you're a parent, make time for fun with your kids. And then also make time for fun just for yourself. You know, you're on campuses where your students are going to class, but there are also lots of extracurricular activities that are available. When I was at Hampton, I was um, in the choir and I danced and um, those things were so important to me. And as an adult, I miss having um, extracurriculars like that. It's important that you um, pay attention to and remember those things that you like doing and that you have those extracurricular activities as well. For me, that's now a Zumba class that I go to that helps to, to fill that, um, that need for me. All right, so make time for fun. Okay.
Okay. So we're moving in now to our discussion time. And so um, I have a question that I would like you to think about and then would love if you want to come off mute to discuss or definitely type in the chat. Um, as you reflect on what we've talked about so far today, so acknowledging and recognizing your strengths and also thinking about the areas in life in which you're experiencing stress, thinking about the impact that that stress may be having on your mental and emotional well-being, and then thinking about where we are at this transition point in the year. What is it that you need most right now? And I want to emphasize, like, I want you to ask this question to yourself. What do I need most right now? And, and to emphasize here, not your kids, not your students, not your spouse or friends or other family members. What is it that you need most right now? And again, you all can feel free to um, come off of mute. Michelle, I love what you said here. I need a personal assistant and three clones of myself. Who, who would agree with Michelle? Absolutely. The housekeeper, too. The person who yes. yes. the clone because one would strictly clean work and home. <laughs> yes. Yes. So personal assistant, three clones, housekeeper, because I would imagine most of us are kind of doing it all, right? Um, we're trying to, to do all those roles in addition to what you're doing, um, doing for, for work. Okay. Fatumata, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. And if not, please come off of mute and, and you can tell me how to pronounce your name. But I see here, I need to build my self-confidence. Yeah. Do you want to say more about, okay, I think I'm glad, I'm glad I pronounced your name correctly. It's really important to me. Um, yeah, do you want to say more about that? Or are there others that can can um, identify with that, like building confidence? I'll, I'll say this, that um, I think that building self-confidence is directly tied to self-care. Um, and maybe the way I'll put it is that sometimes we don't feel like we have the, maybe don't have the right or don't deserve to do the things to take care of ourselves because we feel that the, the needs of others are more important or maybe there's some, you know, deeper seated things around not feeling as though it's okay to value ourselves. Um, I think some of that can be cultural. Some of that I think also is, um, it was cultural in terms of African American culture. I think also just American culture. You know, people are tend to be valued for what they can do, not for just who they are. Um, and Michelle, I see, says we have to learn to value ourselves. Okay, and Fatumata says I don't trust enough by myself. Don't trust myself enough. Yeah, um, I'm wondering if you mean here about trust, like knowing how to set. I guess appropriate or, or sufficient boundaries. So like if I give myself if I if I give myself the self-care, if I, you know, try to set up so put some of these things in place, what if I don't end up getting my work done or getting the things done that I need to do? What if I um what if it takes me off my my focus or off my game? I think sometimes that can be um can be uh, a, a challenge or a concern. Can others identify with that? Yes, certainly. And um, I, I think there's so many pressures, as you mentioned, societal pressures to be um, everything to all people. Um, and in the world of academia, depending on where you are, if you're going up for tenure or um, all those additional pressures, I think, you know, when you talk about uh, to be myself. Sometimes there's pressure to, um, or, or there's a feeling of pressure to do certain things because you are non-tenured or you're going up for that next promotion or, um, and so who do I need to do um, what for whom? I think those are lots of real pressures. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think you're so right about that. And I think it's important 
to keep in mind that if we look to broader society to give us an indication of when it's time to pause and rest or take time for self-care or when you know we're at our limit, that's never gonna come because our society really is not focused in that in that way. Um, I work with lots of patients and who a lot of their stress comes from their jobs and you know uh, people in corporate America, for example, who uh, get emails at 10 o'clock at night and the expectation is that they are going to be responding to those emails. And um, so it's really important to um, make these decisions based on yourself and what what you need. And again, coming back to that idea, what Tumita said about not trusting or, or struggling with some confidence in that, that can be challenging. But um, that's why I think that, you know, Kirsten, as you mentioned earlier about journaling, why these can be such um, important techniques and tools to use to really explore for yourself. And it might also be where, you know, an example of where it's helpful to, if you find, find that you're having trouble doing this, where it might be helpful to get the um, the support of a counselor or some a therapist to kind of run things by to, to be able to kind of process those things. So another question that I have for you all. Um, so in addition to, you know, what do you need most right now? Um, thinking about your, um, your campuses and we had, you know, on the objectives earlier, um, how can you as leaders foster a supportive team environment that helps you to share the workload and alleviate individual burdens? How can faculty and staff on your campus better support one another in such a way that would, you know, help to promote or optimize uh, well-being, mental, emotional well-being? Any thoughts about that? And, and are there any things that you're, that are already happening on your campuses that are you know, that are helpful? If so, please share that as well. I, I will share that um, we are fortunate that our um, latest president has a background in counseling. And so we have adopted a culture of care on our campus. Um, and so um, that is strewn throughout, you know, for students, faculty, et cetera. So we have wellness days built in throughout the semester for staff, faculty, and students. Um, so we have incorporated some of those things, which have been really beneficial. That sounds really, really good. Um, and which institution are you from? Norfolk State University, right, okay. right, right, right across the way. Right across the way. Yes. Yeah. Um, that that sounds wonderful. Um, I'm curious what what happens on the wellness days. What does what do the wellness days look like? Um, so it, it's expected that there are no classes on those days. Um, no assignments are to be given on those days. Uh, we we also have so those are official adopted days within our calendar, if you will. Um, and then actually next week we have some other um, activities. And so there's a um, we have a wellness committee actually on campus, which which I am fortunate to serve on. But they are doing a program for um, faculty. Uh, they had a a um, program this each at the beginning of the end of the semester, they have a program. And so they're trying to promote wellness. Uh, they had nutrition experts. They had actually a comedian um, in the fall, which was kind of a different idea, a, a nice idea. And then this um, next week, they're going to be doing floral arrangements for um, um, mindfulness. They're calling it mindfulness floral arranging or something Yeah, to that effect. So um, we have a speaker talking about wellness. So I, f I feel like we're really fortunate, actually. Yeah, that sounds phenomenal, um, really and truly, and sounds like a, a model that um, would probably be helpful. I don't know if other campuses have similar experiences, um, but that sounds wonderful. And it's something else that that kind of brings to mind. I mean, it sounds like you're really fortunate, Kirsten, being on a campus where that is embedded into the culture. But some of those very same things are things that I would encourage you all to think about doing for yourself. So having a wellness day, looking at your calendar and deciding what, what's going to be my wellness day. And it doesn't, you know, people will talk about like, I need a mental health day. 
And it's fine to take mental health days, but oftentimes I find people, when, when folks are doing that, it's because they're burnt out. And it's like, this is the last you know step to stave off to just being completely burned out. But what about being proactive and scheduling wellness days ahead of time? Um, and then the the mindfulness and kind of fun things like the comedian. I, I love it. That's awesome. Um, does anyone else have other thoughts or things that they'd like to to share? You all have been so um, amazing in terms of your just your, your participation and what you've shared. As we're coming to the end here. I did want to take a moment to just do some check-in and regrounding. Um, so just ask yourself, how am I doing? Right? We we kind of talked at the very beginning about the stress test. You did the stress test. Um, you know, where's your stress level now? Um, maybe just check in with yourself. If you want to share that in the chat, you can um, can certainly do that. Um, how's your body feeling after doing some breathing? and just kind of paying a bit more attention, paying a little bit more attention, hopefully, to yourself. Um, how's your body feeling? I mean, what have you learned today? Are there any, um, any things that you've learned or taken from our time today that you'd like to share? If so, please let us know. I can say that I've learned about um, the program at Norfolk State with the wellness days, and that that's really, really helpful um, information. And um, and also just learning about the ways in which, as you all have shared, the things that you feel that you need, and also the things that you um, are already doing to promote your self-care. And it may be that there wasn't anything um, you know new that was shared today, but if, if the focus was just for you to be able to um, recenter yourself, and I hope this was helpful. And I see Michelle says, I'm doing the right things to manage. Awesome. That's wonderful. Um, I'm really glad to hear that. And um, see, Kirsten says, some of this was familiar. However, it was so beneficial to hear it again and being intentional to take the time to focus. So well, great. I'm, I'm glad that you, um, that you have found it helpful. Um, even when we know all of these things, you know, taking the time, carving the time out to, to dedicate that time just to ourselves is really important. And I, again, as we get ready to finish up here, I just want to encourage you that question of what do I need most right now? Um, ask yourself that question periodically. If you're feeling stressed, overwhelmed, um, feeling like you're sort of starting to tilt in the direction of not being in balance, take that time and ask yourself, what is it that I need most right now? Sometimes I think we can say, ah, there's no point in me asking myself that question because I can't give it to myself. Like I need to go on a vacation for two weeks and not have to answer any emails. And that's not realistic. So there's no point in me asking myself that. But actually, it's still important to ask yourself the question. And then the thing, maybe there's some elements of a vacation that you could pull in um, into your daily life. And then if nothing else, at least you have acknowledged and identified for yourself what you're needing so that you can then make it happen. Just like we talked about, um, you know, being intentional. I think the idea of scheduling some wellness days proactively um, before the end of the semester might be something to do. And see, Fatima says, I learned how to manage my fatigue and stress. I learned the new technique to breathe. That was so beneficial. Wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that. Well, the last thought I'm going to leave you with is um, this quote. I can't take credit for it, but I love it. Um, An empty tank will take you exactly nowhere. Take time to breathe through. All right. So we just thank you so much for being here this evening, for sharing. Um, if you have any you know, final questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Uh, we do have a survey that we'd like to ask you to complete so we can get feedback and, and keep improving these, um, these seminars. The QR code is here, so if you're able to scan it with your phone, you can do that, or we've got the link there at the bottom. But again, um, any questions, 
please uh, let me know. And we've also got the survey link in the chat. Any questions or other other thoughts? All right, Michelle, well, I'm so glad. Michelle says, thank you, I feel good. Awesome. When is the semester um, actually over for you all? Are you, do you have like one more week, two more weeks? I hope, um, okay, Michelle says off to the next meeting. Yep, I know this, these are busy times. You all are so welcome. Um, thank you for, for participating. Okay, Michelle says next week is final. So, yep, you're in the final push. Just keep thinking about what you can do to support yourself and, um, and think about how you're going to treat yourself when you get on the other side. Is hopefully you're going to get some downtime at the, um, at, the, uh, you know, at the end of the semester and during your holiday break. All right. All right. We still have the, um, the survey up if you have not completed that yet, please take a moment to scan that. Oh, you're so welcome, Suzette. And Kirsten, thank you all so much for um, just for, for your participation. I am curious because I'm I'm starting the survey, but I'm what it says. Um, when did you attend the workshop? Is this workshop offered frequently, and can I encourage others to attend another date, or was this it? <laughs> we perhaps can provide okay a, okay a workshop to another like an institution if they're interested. Um, but for right now, this is the only one we have on the books. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, again, thank you all so much for your participation, for being here. I wish everyone health and happiness during the holidays as you're finishing final exams and going into the new year. Um, again, thank you for being here and, and take care. Take care of yourselves.